everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 464. Today we're going to talk about a study in Emerald. And this is not designed by Neil Gaiman, it's actually designed uh, by Martin Wallace. It is based on, I believe, a short story uh, written by Neil Gaiman, who also writes the Sandman comic book, which I'm a big fan of. Now, I did actually a review of the first edition. I almost like that. <laughs> so, what this game is, is very, very different. Now, this is the second edition. It's a lot like the first edition, but there are some uh, sort of on the surface minor changes, but they actually drastically, I think, improve the gameplay. Slight spoiler there. Uh, what it is, is players are either loyalists or restorationists. And what you're trying to do is you're figuring out who's on which team. So it's kind of a hidden role game. Think Battlestar Galactica. It plays nothing like Battlestar Galactica or Dead of Winter or any of those kind of games. It's actually kind of like a deck builder, uh, but a very different kind of deck builder. So you're trying to figure out which team you're on and then score sort of like neutral victory points during a game that you can't necessarily ever lose. And then you're scoring victory points specific to either the Restorationist or the Loyalist faction. And you can kind of try to deduce which team somebody's on based on, you know, which kind of victory points they're going for. But you can kind of bluff too and grab some victory points and maybe even make a surge of victory points to end the game or something like that. But you're actually going to lose any victory points that don't apply to whatever team you were dealt face down. So let's jump into some of the mechanics of the game. So as I said, a study in Emerald pits the Loyalist versus the Restorationist. Now the Loyalists are on the side of Cthulhu and these other demons who are sort of covertly controlling everybody on the planet with different leaders and things. And then you've got Sherlock Holmes types of stuff. You've got vampires. You've got zombies. Don't run away. And... Those are, are the good guys, the restorationists are trying to sort of uncover and reveal the different uh, demonic forces that are in play there and also slay them if they can. Here we've got uh, Nug and Yeb, for example, and they start in Vienna. So what the game is, is a deck building game, and those are the mechanics it uses. Players will be dealt these different identity cards. So players will get pieces in their color. They'll have these little agent tokens uh, like so. And then you get these influence cubes that you'll be putting out on the board as well. And then everybody has a starting deck in their color. You'll take and shuffle these up. You get five cards. Mostly what you're doing with these cards is playing them for the different actions. So for example, this ladder allows you to move agents around. This little card icon allows you to buy cards. This one allows you to put influence cubes on the board and so on. And you'll shuffle those up and get five cards. You also, as you can see, get these different secret roll cards. And you'll put your three sanity tokens on there. And you'll look at this and you could be a loyalist or in the case of the L player, you could be a restorationist. And when these cards are revealed, a couple of things might happen. If it's a restorationist, then the game's going to end. If it are a loyalist, then you're going to put agents out on the board up to three agents. I'll explain what the agents do. And so there's a variety of things that will make you lose sanity here. And then once you lose all three, then you have to reveal. Now there are also a stack of cards that you're going to shuffle up. And you're going to put a certain number of these out into each of the cities. You can see here's London and there's Paris and so on. You're going to put a certain number of those face down based on the number of players. And then you're going to shuffle these in with you can see here is a city card. This is Vienna. So you can see here's the Vienna spot there. Each of these has a city card, which you can uh, get and buy, and they're gonna be worth victory points at the end of the game. And you can see this victory point here is sort of black or gray. These are neutral victory points, like I talked about before. These you won't lose. Now, each of these cities also has a creature. And if you, you always have the top card face up uh, for any of the cities. And if you ever reveal the creature in that city, you'll put that here underneath the city. And this is now available to be attacked or assassinated. Uh, but there's going to be a bunch of other random cards here. For example, you have here uh, Mr. Recluse, and he has a lot of cool special abilities. When you buy him, you actually can put an agent into whatever city he was in, and he's worth two restorationist points at the end of the game. So if you acquire this card and you are a loyalist, nobody knows any better, so you still take the two points on the victory point track up there, but at the end of the game, when it's revealed, then you'll lose those two points. You won't actually actually keep those. But it's kind of a way of bluffing. And you might still buy this card because, like I said, he puts an agent out onto the board, which isn't the easiest thing to do all the time. And he gives you a bunch of different options to uh, play on your turn. 
So what do you do on your turn? You get two actions on your turn, and typically that's playing cards out of your hand of a certain symbol. So if I wanted to, for example, put a bunch of influence on the board, and these five cards here were my hand, I could play all three of these, and this allowed me to put three influence into a single city. So I'll go ahead and put some influence out here on Berlin. Now you will only have five influence to start the game available to you. You will have some here in this kind of limbo area. You will have to actually retrieve influence. And as you sort of capture cards, you, whenever you capture a card, your influence will go to there and you'll have to retrieve it. it kind of makes it a two-step process. So that's the first thing you can do is you can just put influence out. And that's by playing a certain number of cards uh, with this little cube plus a down arrow. Now, you have other cards, like I said, that can allow you to retrieve influence, and that is this guy here. This guy is also an assassin, but if you play multiple symbols of this, then you can pull cubes off actually anywhere on the board, and if I discard multiples of these, I can take them back into my general uh, supply. Now, the next thing you can do is you can actually buy well, you know, one of the cards face up on the board. Now, if you have the most cubes in the city, so I have the most cubes here in Berlin, then the first action that I can do would be to buy the card. However, if it's my now turn as red and yellow and red here are tied, you can see we each have three cubes. I, as the red player, could not put out another cube and then buy. You've got to have the most at the start of your turn. So let's say in this case I did. Uh, then I can play a number of cards with this sort of a card buy symbol there and I can execute that many purchases. So if I was kind of winning influence in two cities, I could play two of these cards here with the buy action, and then you just take the top card off the deck and add it into your discard pile. And as I said before, if you buy a per somebody that has this little symbol there, then you get to put an agent out onto the board. Now I should say, when you check to see who has the most pieces at the start of your turn, you actually check the number of pieces. So if it was this case here, let's say I had these two pieces, as long as one of them is influence, as long as I have the most pieces, I can buy. So it doesn't always have to be influence. The agents will actually help you buy as well, but you just need to have at least one cube. Now, as I said, you can also play cards here with this ladder, and these allow you to move agents, and you can play multiple. So if I played two cards with this ladder symbol like so, then I could move up to two agents, and you can just move them anywhere you want on the board, help you get control. The agents are gonna be used to assassinate these monsters as well as other players. But before I talk about that, let's talk about moving these influence tracks. You can see here's the loyalist track, and the restorationist track. Now, another option on my turn is I could play uh, cards with these little arrows here. And so maybe me as a restorationist player, I might play both of these. I can move the restorationist track a total of three, but there's nothing stopping you from mixing that. If I had some green arrows and pink arrows, I could play them both. So if I had like, you know, each that gave me two, I can move them both up two, and now <laughs> just keep people guessing. Now, as you move this up, so let's say, green gets moved up too. There's now a difference of two uh, between the two factions. So everybody's gonna get that difference. So everybody at this point will get two victory points. Immediately upon that moving, you'll go ahead here and move up the track, two victory points for everybody. You say, well, that's silly, why would you do that? Well, one of the end game triggers is players hitting a certain number of points. So there is a possibility here that even if you're the restorationist, you might feel like you've got a good lead and you'll give everybody points just to trigger that end game. Now, you might lose these points based on you know how you reveal, but that's definitely a possibility in terms of strategic option. But as the game moves along, so let's say you know we go up two more and then everybody will go up here. So now everybody's got sort of a total of four. And then let's say, pink catches up and gets within one. So the difference there is now it's gone from four down to one, so everybody actually will lose three. So you gotta keep track of that as you play, the, basically the difference, and then adjust that, everybody, based on you know however that moves. Now the last thing to talk about is assassination. Uh, so here we have a card that allows us to assassinate, that's the A. And the thing to keep in mind here is whenever you play a card that triggers an assassination, this card will actually go out of the game. You still keep it, but you're, it, it gets removed from your deck. So you can just go ahead and put it over here, maybe kind of like under your, uh, your identity card or something like that. But you just put it to the side and you can't use it again. There are actually some cards, let's find one here. This one is a one use action. So this is similar. When you play this for its action, 
it's removed from your deck. However, you'll still get the victory points for the card, uh, you know, at the end of the game, possibly, at least if you, in this case, if you're a loyalist, you'll still retain that. So let's take a look here first at assassinating these monsters. So this guy here has a strength of five. You can see that. And for every agent that we have in this spot, let's say we had for some reason four total agents in the zone, that gives us sort of four strength or four bomb points to kill this guy. Now we could we'll play the we have to play the assassin card to trigger it. And you can see the assassin card actually has a bomb. But when you play a card, you only get to use it for one of its symbols. So you can't play assassin, you know, and then take it back a cube. We've got to choose one of these. So in this case, we're playing for assassin. We don't get to use the bomb symbol. So we've got four, we need another one. Well, maybe in our hand, we have this other card here that provides us our last bomb symbol. Or maybe we had this guy here. He provides another bomb symbol. So once you total five, then you're gonna take uh, and kill this guy and put it next to you. You're gonna score the victory points. And if you are a restorationist, of course, you'll get to keep those victory points at the end of the game. You might be saying to yourself, why would I ever get victory points that I would lose? And you would do that because you might actually be preventing somebody else from keeping those victory points. And that is sometimes worth it uh, based on how tight the game may or may not be. So the other thing you'll do is anytime you get a card or kill a card that has this symbol on it, you're gonna roll the sanity die. And it's this die here, and only two sides are blank, so you'll roll that. And if you roll this symbol here, then you'll take a sanity disc off of your identity. Now the last thing you might do is actually try to assassinate another agent. Uh, so in this case, when you're looking at the strength to kill the agent, you always look at the strength of the city. So in this case, we need four. So in this case, we have enough agents of our own to assassinate this person. However, in the case of assassination, I, I forgot to mention, you do need to have the most pieces. You don't have to have agents because agents, remember, they just count as bomb points. You could play all the bomb points from your hand, but you do need the most pieces there and likely you will need some agents to do it anyway, uh, but you do need the agents to trigger an assassination. So if you kill this guy, if you uh, played a card that has this symbol here, then you actually get to take that agent off the board and put it on your card. If you play an assassin that doesn't have that little symbol at the bottom, they just get their agent back. But if you do this, you get to get your three points and then you'll retain that if you're the loyalist. So the loyalists are trying to kill other agents. And I should say, you keep that if the agent itself, if the yellow player, for this example, reveals themselves and they're a restorationist. If they're a loyalist, you still don't get the points. So as the loyalist, you're trying to kill the restorationist. So you're trying to get these people that are trying to, you know, subvert your demonic rule here. As the restorationist, you're trying to go and kill the creature. So these are the kind of the two assassination targets. However, that doesn't mean you, you don't have to not kill the other side. You might kill somebody's agent just to get them out of the way because you know they're annoying you. And one of the triggers for revealing a player's identity is actually killing their last agent. If you remove their last agent from the board, everybody starts with two on the board. You place it out at the beginning. But uh, then they immediately just reveal their identity. So you might just kill him for that. And in this case, he's probably gonna be, hopefully if you're smart about it, a restorationist. And if you do that, then the game is going to end. So you can do that at an opportune time to, uh, you know, you can also deplete their agents off the board because it is part of getting majority. It allows them less flexibility. So I just don't want people to focus too much on like, oh, I have to kill these and I have to kill these. There is some sort of conniving and you know manipulative manipulation and stuff like that and who you kill and which cards you buy and everything so everybody's going to be playing their turn two actions per turn uh, and the game's going to end in a couple different ways if you ever reveal a uh, restorationist and that will end the game if one or both of these at the end of a a turn there is at 10 that will end the game and then to base on player count this is upside down but in a two-player game if somebody hits 28 points that'll be the end of the game now the way you score, like I said, you have your kind of neutral victory points that you'll get in the game. These are kind of the safer ones. You get these and they stay with you. You'll lose any points. Like if I was a, a loyalist and I killed you know, one of these monsters, I'd lose that five points that I got and vice versa for the restorationists. And remember, as a loyalist, the person that you killed on these assassin cards has to reveal as a restorationist or you will lose those points. And then you take a look at this track here. So let's say we had, I don't know, this is a seven and this was a 10. Now at this point in the game, everybody was sort of quote unquote, they would have a three victory points. But when you reveal that, 
the loyalists here are higher up, so only they will retain that difference in victory points. All the restorationists will lose those three points. And finally, you're gonna look at whoever is on the team that has a player in last place. This is maybe the most interesting part of the game. Let's say, uh, you know, this is two players, but let's say uh, green and yellow were on two different teams and red was on green's team. All players on that team would lose five points. So green maybe would drop back behind yellow and then red would go down five. So. It's interesting. So let's, that's the game. Let's talk about it in the review. Okay. So that is a study in Emerald. I really like this game. Uh, the first game, like I said, I kind of wanted to like it. It had some issues where we kind of bogged down at the end of the game. Uh, it was just, it had some other wonky things that were very tricky. to so sort of keep it balanced. I feel like this one has, at least for me, fixed all of those issues. Uh, one of the things in the in the first game was you got points for controlling the city, sort of area controlling the city at the end of the game, and those were the safest victory points, right? Those were neutral points just like they are here, but then you had this kind of end game going where like if you control this city and then Billy controls this city and we've kind of figured out that you're on my team and you're in your team, but I wanted to pull you up from being last place, and then I don't want you to do that because I'm on the other team. I, want, I don't want Joel to be in last place. He's going to bring my team down, and I believe if I remember right, in that game, whoever was in last place, nobody on that team could win. It wasn't just like everybody loses five points, which is bad enough. I mean, that can make the difference in this game, but it was, I mean, it can effectively be the same. But in this case, the cities, you just get the card, you got it, and you can use it for its abilities and stuff, and you've got the safe victory points. And then once it's got, it's got nobody else. There's not like a big sloggy fight for the area control at the end of the game. Um, but, and a lot of this stuff is kind of a little bit more streamlined. Like the cards kind of feel like they do a little bit more in this game with kind of the multi-use action stuff. Uh, but it's really, really enjoyable. And I don't think it's gonna be everybody's cup of tea because it's kind of like a mashup of a Battlestar Galactica style of game with a deck builder and kind of like euro -y sort of area control and influence and all that stuff. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is like when you buy cards for the influence, your influence goes to limbo, everybody else gets their influence back. Um, but it's enjoyable and some of the, so some of the neat things about it are, okay, so let's say you have a board and you see this has a city that's some save points, uh, that's got a monster, I could probably try to kill that, but then the cards do lots of cool stuff and they do powerful things. So it's not just like an obvious choice to go, you know, the city points are safe. I'm gonna go get the city points. I'm gonna go get the card that gives me three bombs and it's a one-time use in this case, but that's gonna be awesome. I can go and jump up and kill, assassinate somebody or a monster, or I can get this card that's a free action on my turn so it doesn't use up one of my actions and allows me to sort of discard cards and shuffle them up. I can go get the zombie card and put zombies out. That's gonna like turn agents into zombies and all kinds of stuff. And so there's just a lot of cool abilities that you can go do so early in the game, it's better, of course, it's a deck building game to go get those more engine-y types of cards to sort of tweak your deck and get more efficient. And even just buying the cards to get your agents out on the board is gonna be a huge deal because you're not gonna be getting any assassinating done, honestly, unless you've got some agents out on the board. And the agents are dual purpose. They help you with the influence buys and all that kind of stuff. So it has that kind of cool strategic stuff going on, kind of your Euro stuff, but with that layer of deduction and figuring out who's who. And you might get a card that allows you to like look at somebody's uh, you know, roll card and see what they are. Um, and I like that you can definitely be manipulative and bluffing and you know, play with the victory points a little bit. And so it feels like in this game, I think because it's actually shorter than the first edition, it feels like you're sort of, you can be at least in the dark for more percentage of the game. Now the other one was longer, so it, it felt like you were kind of in the dark for a little while, and then like maybe the second half of the game, everybody kind of knew what was up, and then it turned into a slog. Whereas this, you maybe go along by half hour or so, and then you kind of figure out who's who, unless somebody's playing especially crafty. Uh, and then you kind of, then the game's kind of over before you know it, so you've got to be very careful. So I like that. It, it provides that little bit of layer of tension because, you know, once you, you're kind of at that point, then, oh, we're really close to getting that max victory points or, you know, the different uh, loyalty and restoration tracks have moved up. So then at that point, you hope your deck is made to do what you wanted it to do. Um, yeah, so it's very, very unique. I think people should really give this a try. 
I'm a big fan of this one now. I've, I really am enjoying this one. Um, the other neat thing about it is you have this huge stack of cards here. It doesn't look huge, but you don't use every card every game. So some, and the other thing is you could have everybody on the same team, uh, you know, in a game. It's fe feasible that everybody's on the same team because there's only one winner. So in that case, you're still kind of playing competitively. And in that case, that whole kind of semi-co-op thing really just kind of magically works in this case. Uh, so, you know, I mean, you may have a game where you don't have zombies, for example, you don't have the vampires, or you don't have Sigmund Freud and Yogg-Sothoth and Cthulhu might not be in there. And, you know, these different cool abilities that you played with last time are not in there at all. Uh, so this is a high recommendation for me. Now this is, I should note this, this I thought this was gonna be a Tree Frog release. It does have Tree Frog on the box, but this is actually being brought over by Gray Fox Games. Um, so look kind of to them to when this is being released. I think it's coming out really, really soon. So it's kind of sandbagging the review a little bit <laughs> to release it when it's more pertinent. Uh, but yeah, definitely great recommendation for me on this one. Thanks.